A Psalm of David, the most highest of hosts, saith unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool, the rod of thy strength. The Most High will send out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people offer themselves willingly in the day of thy warfare, in adornments of holiness, from the womb of the dawn, Thine is the dew of thy youth. The highest of hosts has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the manner of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand doth crush kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He filleth it with the dead bodies. He crusheth the head over a wide land. He will drink of the brook in the way. Therefore will he lift up the head. All praise to the Most High. Allow. Oh, wow. Section 107 of the Copyright Act. We're talking certain types of uses. Teaching, scholarship, and research. Nothing more, nothing less. You know how we do. Episode number 46. Let me say it again. The Most High don't miss. Are we the Dracons? Dragons found here in the Americas. Let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comment box. We're going to take our time on this one. Kick back. Sit back. And enjoy the show. You are now tapped in with Dragon Canoe. We are steadily rowing and we are constantly flowing. Allow. Oh, wow. After the victory over the Merkits, Temujin became a serious contender in the struggle for mastery of the Mongol tribes. He had once more a tribal following of his own. The Mongol people began to regard him as their champion in the struggle to unite the Mongol tribes and reestablish their former power. Tales began to spread that Temujin had a heavenly mandate and was destined to become Lord of the Steppe. When the Ba'arin Korchi came to join Temujin, he declared, Jamuka and I are from the same womb. We would never have deserted Jamuka but for the appearance of a heavenly omen. And then a hornless white ox appeared, trailing a large tent post, which was harnessed to its back, and it came up behind Temujin, bellowing again and again. Heaven and earth have agreed that Temujin shall be the lord of the empire. Later, at a location on the Korkonar River, where Kutula Khan used to hold festivities, Mukali made known a similar omen which he claimed to have received from heaven. The shamans took care to spread these stories. Monglik's son, the shaman Kokushu Teb Tingri, related how the Most High had told him, I have given the whole surface of the earth to Temujin and to his sons. Such prophecies did not fail to influence the superstitious Mongols. And whether he was responsible for the instigating them or not, Temujin well understood how to exploit them as propaganda. After the victory over the Merkits, he may perhaps have begun to believe in his mission. Thanking Toru and Jamuka for their support, Temujin proclaimed at the same time, My strength was fortified by heaven and earth, foreordained by mighty heaven. I was brought here by Mother Earth. So they're setting the stage for Temujin to become Lord of the Steppe. The breach between Jamuka and Temujin. Remember, Jamuka. Keep them in your mind. The breach between Jamuka and Temujin drew the battle lines. Some Mongols declared for Temujin. A conflict between the two rivals became inevitable 
and nomadic custom required that a Khan be elected before the forthcoming struggle. There he was joined by Sashabeki and Taishu, the two sons of Sorkatu of the Jerkin, a tribe related to the Borjagid, both tribes being descended from sons of Kabul Khan. To the Kamurka camp came also Kushar Beki, the son of Yesugai's elder brother, Nekun Taishi, and Alton Ochigin, a son of Kutula. All these relatives were senior to Tamujin in the family hierarchy and had a greater claim than himself to the title of Khan. Again, to the title of Khan. As Tamujin reminded them in a later message, they were all initially offered the Khanship, and he, Tamujin, was only elected after they had rejected the title. So Tamujin claimed the title of Khan after the so-called relatives of his family um, who had a higher position basically refused the title, so they say. He had proved his military ability in the campaign against the Merkits, and he had enriched himself with followers and herds. Above all, Excuse me. He enjoyed the favor and the protection of the powerful leader of the Karaites, Togru. Having broken with Jamuka, Altan and Kushar found themselves in a quandary. Dependent only on their own forces, they could not hope to withstand any attack by Jamuka. Their only alternatives were to seek protection from Temujin or from the Karaites. Through him, they could most readily achieve their personal interests. Later, realizing that in electing Tamujin, they had chosen a leader who was determined to use an iron fist to enforce his own will. They both allied themselves with Wang Khan in his struggle against Tamujin. Again, we're just setting the stage here. It is more difficult to explain the stance of Sasha Becky descended from a more senior branch than Temujin and himself eager for power. Again, we're talking the game of thrones. Although other factors may also have influenced him, he too, like Altan and Kushar, probably underrated Temujin's strength of will and ambition. After consulting with and obtaining the consent of Sasha Beki, Altan and Kushar agreed to elect Temujin. They declared, we wish to make you Khan, and they swore the following oath of allegiance. When you are Khan, Temujin, we will ride as your spearhead against the multitudinous enemy and bring back their beautiful women and maidens and their ceremonial tents. And from the foreign tribes, we will bring comely women and maidens, also their fine limb geldings at a trot, and present them to you. When we hunt the wild animals, we will be in the van of the hunters and we will give you the slaughtered animals. We're talking about paying tribute to Temujin, the vassal of Wang Kong. If on the day of battle, we do not obey your commands, separate us from our belongings. Throw our black heads away on the empty step. Having sworn this oath, they made Temujin Khan, naming him Genghis Khan. It is generally incorrectly assumed that the title of Genghis Khan was not conferred on Temujin until after the subjugation of the nomadic tribes. Elevation to the rank of Khan was, however, of great significance to Temujin. Temujin was now an equal partner of the Karaite leader. True, the Khanship was yet only titular. The majority and the most powerful of the Mongol tribes such as the Taishiu or Taishiwu, the Anjara, the Seljiu, the Seljiwu, Bo or Shu, and Jelme, in overall charge, Tamujin hastened to send messages to the Karaite leader and to Jamuka, informing them of his election. So Tamujin gets elected Khan. First thing he does is wants to let 
Togrul and Jamuka, who also have claims to the throne, with Togrul being the king and father of Temujin, not biological, but based off of Anda or blood brothership, or what they call Anda, brothers of the cloth of Temujin's father, Yesugai, and Togrul. Togrul was delighted with the election of his vassal as Khan. It is right and proper that you have elected my son Temujin as your leader. How could you Mongols be without a leader? Togrul, he had, however, no cause to doubt Temujin's loyalty and offered Togrul greater certainty of maintaining dominance over the Mongol tribes than would the intriguing and unreliable Jamuka or the ambitious Sashabeki of the Jerkin. Clever Jamuka, Jamuka Session, had no illusions about the consequences of the election of his Anda as Khan. Anda meaning brother of the cloth <clears throat> or blood brother, Anda. He did not conceal his suspicion and sent a message to Altan and Kushar. Why have you caused a breach between my Anda Temujin and myself? Why did you not elect Anda Temujin as Khan while we were together? What thoughts have motivated you to elect him Khan now? So you got Jamuka over here. Stirring it up. He's stirring the pot. The campaign against the Merkits. Again, the Merkits. So-called Nestorians. Reacting to that election, Jamuka made preparations for a counterattack, and this led to the Battle of Dalan Balzut. It is known from the official history of the Qin, however, that the campaign against the Tartars did not play, take place until 1196. Rashid Ad-Din comments that from 1168 to 1194, Temujin experienced great difficulties and suffered tribulations of many kinds and that events were thus not recorded in detail, nor for every year of that period. So, according to Rashid Ad-Din, there's about 30 years of Temujin that we pretty much don't get any information on this man. But allegedly, he suffered great difficulties and tribulations of many kinds that were thus not recorded. Clearly, Something in Temujin's life has been concealed. Whatever it may have been was taboo not only for contemporaries, but also for later historians because it was detrimental to the prestige of the world conqueror. Let that sink in. It's about 30 years of Temujin's life goes unaccounted for, not because it possibly wasn't recorded in detail, because whatever it may have been was taboo not only for contemporaries, but also for later historians. What was Temujin really on? You let me know. Leave a note in the comments. Togrul fled to Karakata. Some Chin rebels took refuge with the nomads, while others sought nomad assistance to exact revenge for wrongs which they claimed to have suffered. The coalition led by Jamuka caused a crisis. Temujin's defeat undermined the strength of the Karaite ruler and his brother, Urkakara seized the opportunity to intrigue against and finally drove Togrul from his kingdom. The Altan Khan, aka Golden Khan, the nomadic name for the Chin Emperor. Togrul's rule was, however, constantly threatened by internal family strife and by the enmity of the Naimans. The Naimans from the last episode, so called Nestorian Naimans. Togrul had ascended the Karaite throne by committing fratricide, meaning he killed his brother or sister in order to gain power, so they say. And Togrul saw assistance from Enan Khan of the Naimans. So again, how are you going against the Naimans but seeking assistance from the Naimans? So-called Nestorian Naimans who drove Togrul from his country and placed Urkakara on the throne. Togrul fled to Karakata, but had been there little more than a year when he rebelled against the Gurkhan. In dire distress, he plundered his way through the lands of the Uyghurs and the Tangus, they said.
The secret history reports that in recognition of the earlier friendship between Togrul and Yesuga, Temujin's father, Temujin came from the source of the Carolin to meet Togrul and imposed a special levy on his own tribe to support Togrul. Most sources report this occurrence in connection with Togrul's first banishment at the time of Yesuga. The dating 11th year Daring offered in Shishia Shushi is quite out of the question since at the time Temujin was in no position to offer support to the Karaite ruler. I'll run it back, run it back. This would place the meeting immediately before the campaign against the Tartars. It is clearly his interpretation that the Karaite leader returned to Mongolia only after Temujin's victorious attack on the Tartars. Togrul's absence was a relatively long one, they say. Such a hypothesis excludes any partation, participation by Togrul in that campaign, and it must now be considered to what extent this can be supported by the text. The role of the Tartars in the traditional policies of the Qin emperors was that of Gendarmis, whose duty it was to ensure that no East Mongolian tribe became sufficiently powerful to pose a threat to the jerky. So their job was basically to make sure no tribe was strong enough to oppose the jerky. Yet the avaricious and quarrelsome Tartars were not completely reliable and had often carried out plundering raids into northern China or instigated rebellions against the jerky. So the Tartars job was to make sure no, no Mongolian tribes became powerful enough to oppose the jerky. Yet the Tartars often carried out plundering raids and rebellions against the jerky. So you let me know what that means. Leave a note in the comments. A Tartar chieftain, Sekchu, rebelled because of a dispute over the division of spoils. The jerky commander, Wanyan Xiang, Ang Ying Ching Sang, made a surprise attack on the Tartars and forced them to flee northwards. The Tartar retreat sent messages to the Jerkins suggesting that they join forces with him against the Tartars. So Temujin learned of the Tartar retreat and tried to get the Tartars to join in. Excuse me. Temujin learned of the Tartar retreat and sent messages to the Jerkin suggesting that they join forces with him against the Tartars. So Temujin doing anything he could to get the Tartars up out the way. The Tartar princeling, again, princeling, meaning kid, I would assume, or baby, Muzin Sultu, Megujin Seultu, was killed and Temujin carried off his golden cradle and pearl encrusted quilt. We're talking carried off his golden cradle. So that lets you know the Tartar princeling was a youngin. The Qin commander Wanyan Xin rewarded Temujin with the title of Chaut Kuri and at the same time bestowed upon Togrul the title of Wang Khan. So Temujin's so called Unk Togrul became Wang Khan and Temujin became Chaut Kuri while bestowing Togru with the title of Wang Khan. Togru was an elderly and obedient man, constantly preoccupied with protecting his throne from the machinations of his relatives. He was not dangerous to the Qin Empire. This princely title was intended to enhance Togru's authority in the eyes of the nomads. Although Temujin had to consent himself with a modest title, the balance of power between himself and Wang Khan, as I shall henceforth refer to Togrul, had fundamentally changed. So the relationship changed when Togrul becomes Wang Khan. Temujin still needed Wang Khan, and for this reason alone restored him to his people. The political initiative had, however, passed into Temujin's hands, and with Wang Khan's assistance, he intended to realize his ambitious plans, encompassing the destruction of all potential rivals and enemies who might stand in his way. 
Temujin no longer felt himself to be Wang Kang's vassal, but rather his equal partner. And this is where it gets interesting. When the Karaite ruler sought his assistance, meaning when Wang Kang sought Temujin's assistance, later events made clear that Temujin exploited Togrul's plight to wring from him promises and concessions. So Temujin is playing a double game here. So they say, yes, he is Togrul's vassal, but Temujin uses that, or as they say, exploits that to get things from Wang Khan in order to increase his own presence on the steppe. Temujin was not the only one who sought to achieve mastery over the tribes of Eastern Mongolia. The events which followed the execution of the Jerkin princes and the death of Bori are confused. Their dating is doubtful, and the many contradictions between the texts emphasize the problematical character of the chronology. So again, you can't always follow the chronology. Just listen to the story. Let me know what you think. Leave a note in the comments, man. We can't make this up. We're just following the drinking gourd here. Staying in check. Searching for the male keys of deck. Thus, for example, secret history stating that Wang Khan's campaign against the Merkits, the battle against Baruk Khan of the Naimans, the Tartar and Taishiwu campaigns, all took place in the year of the dog, they say, and before the election of Jamuka as Gur Khan. Rashid's chronology is in general followed by the Shin Wu and the Yuan Shi. The sacred history continues its story with the election of Jamuka as Gurkhan. The execution of the Jerkin princes took place as we have seen. The secret history thus has a gap of four or five years. Rashid's chronology of the events appears more reliable. Temujin's next moves were directed towards restoring Wang Khan's rule over the Karaites. The first step was to force Jagambu into submission and bring him together with Tonkite, a vassal tribe of the Karaites back from China to join and support Wang Khan. Temujin together with Wang Khan and Jigambu, the, later, the latter later deserted to the Naimans then unto, undertook a successful campaign against to Toabeki of the Uduit Marquites. After the campaign, Temujin presented the whole of the spoils to Wang Khan and his retinue. <clears throat> so you got Temujin, Wang Khan, and Jigambu Jigambu is part of Wang Khan's camp. Apparently, Jigambu deserted to the Naimans eventually, and Temujin and Wang Khan undertook a successful campaign against Tokowabeki and the Merkits. After so, Temujin presented all the spoils to Wang Khan. Temujin was Wang Khan's vassal. The Wan Shi virtually repeats the text, but adds that the emperor, Chinggis Khan, presented to Wan Khan all the goods and provisions after the defeat of the Merkits. Wan Khan now felt strong enough to act independently. Without informing or consulting with Temujin, he attacked the Merkits, killed to Toabeki's son, taking prisoner his two daughters and two brothers. Moreover, Wang Khan retained all the spoils for himself, offering no share to Temujin. So again, Temujin delivers the spoils of the Merkins to Wang Khan. Wang Khan goes off doing his own thing, killing to Toabeki's son, and pretty much claiming everything for himself. He doesn't see Temujin as his equal. Temujin only sees Wang Khan as his king and father. What Temujin really wanted for was for Wang, Wang Khan to see Temujin as his equal. It ain't happening. Temujin was enraged by Wang Khan's behavior. He had used Wang Khan as a stepping stone to power and would continue to support him. Temujin set off, together with Wang Khan, to fight the Karaite leader's arch enemy, Baruch Khan of the Naimans. And Nan Khan, who deposed Wang Khan, had died, dividing his empire between his two sons, 
Baruch Khan and Tayang Khan. The brothers were sworn enemies, perhaps on account of a love affair. Although Peliot surmises that the real cause of the enmity was the nomination of the younger son as Enoch Khan's successor, Baruch only ruled only the mountainous area of Altai, while Tayang had received the steppe area on the Black Ertish. Temujin and Wang Khan took advantage of the discord between the brothers. They reached the camp of Baruch Khan, who clearly not anticipating the attack, took flight and was pursued across the Altai Mountains. Returning from this pursuit, Temujin and Wang Khan were confronted by a name and army, commanded by Koksua Sabrak. Temujin and Wang Khan drew up their troops ready for battle the following morning. Wang Khan, however, pulled out secretly during the night. The secret history attributes this decision to the intervention of Jamuka. So here, Jamuka again stirring the pot. Jamuka accused Temujin of treason. My Anda Temujin has for a long time had diplomatic relations with the names. Jamuka persuades Wang Khan. Now he has not come with you? My lord, my lord, I am a constant, white feathered bird. My Anda is a lark, a bird of passage. He will have joined the Namans. He has remained behind in order to submit to them. So Jamuka's like telling Wang Khan, like, Temujin about to hit you with double, damn near triple cross. But Jamuka really just stirring the pot. The following morning, when Temujin realized that Wang Khan had deserted and left him in the lurch, he also retreated. Kokseu Sabrak did not, however, attack Temujin. He pursued Wang Khan, carrying off the wife, children, and followers of Singun, Wang Khan's son, as well as half of Wang Khan's people and also his herds and food supplies. Thereupon, Wang Khan sent a messenger to Temujin with an appeal for help. Temujin dispatched warriors to Wang Khan's assistance. These saved Singum from capture and rescued his followers and children. This account raises many questions, especially that of Temujin's puzzling behavior. Wang Khan had betrayed him, deserting secretly on the eve of the battle, they say. Despite this, Temujin sends his most devoted companions to rescue Wang Khan's son. An ingenious solution to this question is offered by Gumalev who suggests that following interpretation of the events. During the night before the battle, Temujin makes several demands of Wang Khan. So, this is, might be what they're leaving out, so they say. Temujin makes several demands of Wang Khan, allegedly, but Jamuka also says that Temujin has another plot that he's running, he's scheming, he's trying to hit him with the double cross. The latter rejects these and immediately leaves the battlefield. So Wan Khan's like, man, I'm out of here. When, however, the Karaites have been defeated by Kokseo Sabrak, Wan Khan is compelled to accept Temujin's conditions. Temujin interpreting the pill for help. So basically, Wan Khan is then forced to accept Temujin's conditions because Kokseo Sabrak is going crazy, kidnapping and capturing his son, his daughter in law grandkids you know what i mean so then Wan khan's like i might actually need temujin's help it seems certain that when the deposed Wan khan sought temujin's assistance the latter made several demands of Wan khan so again temujin's like i got him right where i want him he needs my help but this is what i need in that hour of need Wan khan found himself constrained to agree to temujin's conditions but later regretted his promise and deserted with his forces. The author of the secret history alludes to the possibility that Temujin's demands concern the succession to the Karaite throne. So allegedly, Temujin not only claims to help want to help Wan Khan, but he's got ulterior motives to claim the Karaite throne from Wan Khan and Singun. When Wan Khan learned of his son's rescue, he exclaimed, my Anda, Yasugai Bagatur, initially rescued my lost people and now his son, Temujin, has again rescued my lost people. So Wang Khan is thankful and Wang Khan realizes the relationship he had with Temujin's father as his blood brother or 
brother of the cloth, they say. So he gives thanks to Temujin, but he still doesn't see Temujin as his equal. When these two, father and son, reunited with me, my lost people, for whom did they take such trouble to assemble them? Wang Khan thought, I am now an old man. When I grow older, when my life is spent and I am at rest on the heights and I ascend the mountain cliffs, who will rule my people? My younger brothers have no ability. My son, Singum, is a non-entity and he is my only son. I will make my son, Temujin, Singum's elder brother so that having two sons, I can then rest in peace. Wang Khan and Temujin met in the Black Forest on the Tula River, where they renewed their Anda Accord as father and son, agreeing to fight their enemies together, to hunt together, and give no credence to the words of envious persons or enemies until they had talked face to face. So this allegedly was the deal. Wang Khan and Temujin re, uh, renewed their Anda, basically stemming from Yesugai and Wang Khan's initial Anda. And then Wang Khan needing the assistance of Temujin and Temujin helping him get his family back. He's like, whatever, we in this together. Anytime we make a move, let's talk first. So they say. When Wang Khan's departure from the battlefield did not have the expected result, he attempted to take Temujin prisoner, they say. Here's where it starts to get real crazy. Rashid's account is also preferable because Jamuka's allegation possibly a stratagem designed to divide and thus weaken his two rivals so jamuka is like the enemy of my enemy is my friend and i'm about to i'm about to create a rift between these two in order to get what i want that temujin sought to betray wan khan is in direct contrast to temujin's actions and after wan khan's furtive withdrawal temujin's plan was with wan khan's assistance to gain the Kararite throne so Temujin's play was like, if I help Wang Khan, I stay tapped in with Wang Khan. Uh, he considers me to be his son. I have a right to the Kerite throne. They like Wang Khan and Sengum, like, nah. This claim by Temujin to succeed the Kerite throne, rather than any fear of treachery on Temujin's part, was the real reason for Wang Khan's behavior. Wang Khan is like, it ain't happening. Temujin would certainly not have rushed to the aid of Sengum, Wang Khan's son, if he had nursed the treacherous intentions ascribed to him by Jamuk. So they say. According to Rashid's text, Temujin and Wang Khan moved from Sara Kahar to attack and defeat the Taishi Wu, killing the princes Tarkatai and Kadudar. This campaign is not mentioned in the secret history, which we must know also recounts the campaign against Baruch Khan. So there's missing pieces to the puzzle here. The aims pursued by Temujin had now become obvious, who, sparking off a reaction among the tribal leaders who realized that unless they submitted to Temujin, they could expect to share the fate of the jerkin princess. So if you don't go along with Temujin, it's pretty much a wrap. So a lot of the tribes was like, all right, we'll just rock with Temujin because we already know what happened. You know what happened to the last jerkin princess. The Wanshi records when the Harajin, Karajin, Sanji Wu, Doluban, Tartar, Dadar, and Hangjila, Anjira tribes learned that the Naaman and the Taishi Wu had been defeated, they became very fearful and could not settle down. They concluded a treaty of alliance, sealing it by sacrificing a white horse and swearing an oath that they would attack Tamujin and the Wan Khan. So out of fear, like we gotta fight we gotta stand up and fight against Temujin and Wang Khan we'll see how that plays out the defection and flight to the Naamans by Jagambu and four of Wang Khan's highest dignitaries is almost readily explained by a defeat of rather than a victory by the Kerite leader Wang Khan's reverse was exploited by the allies a group of tribal princes assembled by the Algui Spring where they renewed their alliance by sacrificing a gelding and a mare and swearing another oath. So again, we got a conspiracy here against Wang Khan. In the year of the cock, they elected Jamuka as Gurkhan, Khan of all the tribes. So somehow Jamuka then finessed his way to become Gurkhan, Khan of all the tribes. Somehow. 
After the election, they resolved to take the field once more against Temujin and Wang Khan. So again, Jamuka, my man is really, he's really hitting on with the triple cross. There was a social background to the impending struggle. The old step order hung in the balance. And the tribal princes concerned to preserve their independence were solid in their opposition to Temujin. Baruch Khan of the Namans, Kutu the son of Toktoabeki of the Merkits, Kudukabeki of the Orates, and the Taishibu princess Tarkatai Kiltuk, Aushu Bagator, and others adhered to Jamuka's coalition. So they all was like, all right, Jamuka, if we can get Wan Khan and Temujin out of here, we can all run this. But again, Temujin, warned by a Corolla tribesman of the coalition's decision, immediately sent a messenger to Wan Khan. Wan Khan's fate was bound to Temujin's. He had slipped into dependence on the latter and the coalition had decreed his destruction. So take this as a life lesson here. Wan Khan relied too heavily upon Temujin and to the point where he depended on Temujin more than he needed to. And with that being said, created his own downfall I, I, I don't know how a better way to say it the opposing armies met at Koitan the secret history reports that when hostilities recommenced Baruch Khan of the Namans and Kadukabeki of the Orates attempted to use their powers to confuse the enemy by magical weather again this is where it gets real fantastical confuse the enemy by magical weather the magical rainstorm however changed direction they could not move forwards but fell into ditches and they said heaven does not favor us and their forces broke up the namans Merkits, orates and the taishiwu left the field and jamuka himself fled home but not before robbing those who had elected him an action which ended forever his short-lived leadership so jamuka pretty much xed himself out the game eventually but that's what happens. Victory over the tribal coalition and the destruction of the Taishi Wu awakened a new ambition in Temujin. He would not only inherit the leadership of the Karaite, but would also extend his rule over all the peoples who lived on the Mongolian steppe. Single mindedly, he prepared the destruction of those enemies who might stand between him and this goal. From time immemorial, the Tartars had been claimants to hegemony in Mongolia. Although disunited, they were a dangerous enemy, greatly, greatly superior to Temujin's hordes in numbers, wealth, and civilization. These arch enemies of the Mongols had to be defeated. After his victory over the Tartars, Temujin considered the time to ripe to strengthen his claim to the throne of the Karaite ruler by a marriage alliance. So this is where they draw the line in the sand basically this is some of the coldest stuff i didn't ever heard so tap in listen listen closely here temujin's eldest son joshi would receive wang khan's daughter as wife in return temujin would promise one of his daughters to the son of sangun the marriage proposal was rejected by an indignant sangun this is what sangun said to him listen to how cold this is when one of our women goes to you, she is left standing by the door, constantly looking towards the place of honor. When, however, one of our women comes to us. All right, let me run that back. Listen to what Singum told the Temujin. When one of our women goes to you, she is left standing by the door, constantly looking towards the place of honor. When, however, one of your women comes to us, she sits in the place of honor looking towards the door so Sangoon was like i'll be ain't no way we, we no it ain't no it's not happening y'all don't treat y'all women right that's what he said this was Sangoon's reply according to the secret history which he adds these words caused chingis khan to lose his heartfelt affection for Wan khan and nilka Sangoon. it had become obvious that the succession to the Karaite throne was at stake and they moved to join Sangum, Jamuka, Altan, and Kushar. Once again, it is Jamuka who attempts to force immediate action. So Jamuka just can't help himself. If you do not strike at once, what will become of you? 
if you move against Anda Temujin, then I will attack him on his flank. For you, we will kill the sons and the elder brothers of Mother Hoalan and throw their younger brothers on the steppe. Others made similar promises and Sengum then sent messages to his father to inform him of the agreement. Wang Khan was irresolute. He was in a difficult position. So Sengum pretty much seals the fate for Wang Khan because he draws a line between his two sons, his blood son and his godson, essentially. Until now, Temujin had always been his support and Wang Khan did not trust Jamuka. Nobody does. Sing Excuse me. Singum then went personally to his father and said, Even now, while you are still alive, Temujin leaves us no power. When my lord and father, you are very old. Will he permit us to rule your people with your father, Kiriakis Baruch Khan? Again, let that sit in. Remember, Kiriakis and Marcus are Togrul's father and grandfather with the Christians named Marcus and Kiriakis. Not only Kiriakis, but Kiriakis Baruch Khan. By whom and in what fashion will he have our people ruled? Wang Khan was bound by his promises to Temujin, and he could not even trust his son. Temujin had accused of lusting after the Karaite throne, even during the lifetime of Wang Khan. How can I reject my child, my son? Is it right to plan mischief against him when we have until now looked to him for support? This infuriated Singun, who stormed out. Eventually, in order to avoid a breach with his son, Wang Khan allowed Singun freedom of action. So eventually, Wang Khan was like, when it comes down to it, I'm rocking with my son, Singun. The secret history places the blame for the breach with Temujin squarely on Singun, but also, also although <laughs> the initiative for the break doubtless originated with Singun, Wang Khan also sought to rid himself of his ambitious vassal. Oral tradition reported by Marco Polo. Excuse me. Oral tradition reported by Marco Polo also attributes to Wang Khan responsibility for the failure of the marriage alliance. Temujin's message is said to have caused Wang Khan to erupt in rage. How dare Chinggis Khan seek the hand of my daughter, he exclaimed. Does he not recognize that I am his liege, that he is my vassal? Go back and tell him that I would rather burn my daughter than give her to this, to his family in marriage. So Wan Khan popped off on him. He wasn't going. Wan Khan did not, however, seek open conflict. He let it ride, kinda. Eventually, uh, agreeing to the proposed marriage alliance, they invited Temujin to a betrothal feast. Joy at the fulfillment of his wishes caused Temujin to forget his customary caution and sus suspicion. Only when he spent a night en route with Father Mang Leek and the latter warned him not to trust Singum's sudden change of mind. Singum once again decided to take the field with his allies against Temujin. Learning of the plans from a secretly overheard conversation, they hastened to warn Temujin. At the Kurultai in 1206, they were appointed to command divisions and raised to the rank of Dar Khan. These are Genghis Khan's words to them. Now you shall both my supporters rejoice that I create you quiver bearers and cup bearers. Whatever that means. According to this account, Wang Khan suggested to the shaman Teb Tingri, son of Mangli, who had married a girl from the Karaite sub-tribe, that they attacked Temujin on two fronts. Teb Tingri, it is claimed... Teb Tingri, the informant, Teb Tingri, it is claimed, informed Temujin of this plan. And this was one reason for Wang, Khan, Wang Khan's defeat. In the struggle against the Karaite leader, Temujin represented the national interests of the Mongols, they said. It was certainly not only his imposing figure which caused the members of the former ruling house of the Katans, the brothers Ila, Ahai, and Tuka, to declare for Temujin. If he was the victorious, they expected strong support from him in their fight against the hated jerky. The Muslim merchants, Jafar and Hassan, came from the Ongut, and they entered Temujin's service because they expected from his victory favorable terms. So everybody's got their own side plot going on here. Temujin, as we just have seen, even succeeded in recruiting dependents of the Karaite tribe. 
Whoever deserted the Unk Khan in order to join and support Chinggis Khan was showered with signs of the latter's favor. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. Thus, according to Al Umari, Chinggis Khan's power and influence multiplied and his eminence and reputation increased. Among these Karaite defectors was Chinggai, who became one of Chinggis Khan's closest advisors. Temujin was well aware of Wang Khan's difficult position, and in his famous message, he sought to convince the latter that only in alliance with himself could Wang Khan continue to exercise his role as leader. So Temujin's like, you can't do nothing without me. You need me. He accused Wang Khan of having broken their agreement. Wang Khan, he asserted, had allowed himself to be provo provoked and incited by an outsider, Jamuka. If a two-shafted cart has broken, has a broken shaft, the ox cannot pull it. Am I not your second shaft? Temujin's services to Wang Khan were not inconsiderable. His father, Isagai, had already assisted the so-called fratricidal Wang Khan in his hour of need and returned his people to him. When Wang Khan fled for the second time, it was Temujin who gave refuge to Wang Khan. The following year, Temujin plundered the Merkits and presented everything to Wan Khan. When Kok Seu Sabrak of the Naimans captured Singum's wife and his people, Temujin responded to Wan Khan's plea for help and sent troops under his four great commanders to recover Singum's wife and people. My king and father, what cause do you now have to reproach me? Temujin demands of Wan Khan. So Temujin is coming to collect Temujin had brought Jagambu back from China in order to assist in restoring Wang Khan to the throne. He had, at Wang Khan's behest, killed the Jerkin princes Sasha Beki and Tai Shu. While Wang Khan had undertaken a loan without waiting for Temujin, a jointly planned attack on Toktoa of the Merkits and had retained all the spoils for himself. Temujin had done Wan Khan a further service when he sent his four great warriors to save and return his captured people from the Naimans. Finally, Temujin had on Wan Khan's behalf subdued the Dorbits, Tartars, Shelzhuwu, and Tang Kai, the tribes with which Wan Khan now threatened him. What have you done which was to my advantage? Temujin demands of the Karaite ruler. He reminds Wan Khan, I have valid claims upon you. Again, Temujin's coming to collect, man. Wan Khan is in a difficult position. With Sungum as with Jamuka, there could be no question of any pact. Temujin informed the naked born son, the natural son of Wan Khan, Sungum, Our king and father sought to care for us equally. Fearing that I might come between you, you have pursued me with your hate. Do not cause our king and father to grieve. Do not estrange yourself from him by holding to your earlier thoughts and continuing to contemplate becoming ruler while our king and father still lives. It is clear to me what lies behind these words. Singum received the message and exclaimed, It is clear to me what has lies behind these words. They are the opening words of battle. Raise the war banner. It's going down. Singum knew that the impending battle would be decisive. She reports him as saying, if he, Temujin, is victorious, then our Alus will be his. If we are the victors, his Alus will belong to us. Informed by his messengers that Wan Khan was unprepared and was feasting unconcernedly, Temujin decided to attack immediately and rode with his troops through the night to Wan Khan's encampment. Although taken by surprise, the Karaites put up a fierce resistance and the battle raged for three days. Wang Khan fled during the night and was killed by a Naaman, they say, who failed to recognize him. Singum fled to Tibet and from there to the Khotan and Kashgar, where he was later captured and killed. So, they, you know, they forced him into a trap. That's the end of Wang Khan, the end of Singum. There's no true Karai ruler left other than Temujin to claim the throne as his own. Such was the inglorious end of the ruler of the mighty Karaite Empire, of whom even the West had heard through the legend of Prester John. Wang Khan had borne the stigma of fratricide and had ensured that at the end of the day he stood alone, surrounded by internal and external enemies. 
He had given Temujin his trust, had supported him and assisted him to power, even while fleeing Wan Khan had doubts whether he had treated Temujin correctly in turning his back on him. Have I broken with the man who may have deserved that I should not desert him? Or have I distanced myself from someone who has deserved such estrangement? Wang Khan places the blame firmly on his son, Sangum. The Kararite princesses were married off. Temujin took for himself Jagambu's elder daughter, Ibaka. Although he later separated and gave her in marriage to Jerkadai, to whom he also entrusted the killing of Jagambu. So again, <clears throat> this is the real Game of Thrones right here. The younger daughter, Sorkatani, later to play an important political role, was given to Temujin's son, Tolui, who also received the Wan Khan's granddaughter, Doku's Khatun. So basically, they're marrying off the Kararite princesses to claim the throne of the Kararites for themselves. Ilkhan Hulegu married, and she exercised great influence on religious policies. According to the secret history, Joshi was given Wan Khan's daughter. Sha'or Beki, but Berazin maintains that Temujin kept her for himself. The Kararite people were plundered and enslaved by the victors. Man, we, got, we back for another one, man. I, I can't make this up. Episode number 46, The Most I Don't Miss. Think about who think about the Kararites. Take a second, sit on it, rest on it. Let me know what you think. Get back to me. What's it sound like to you? How does this make you feel? What do you think? What are the, the lessons learned in this one, man? It is what it is. Are we, are you, the Dracons, dragons, found in the Americas? Leave a note in the comments. Let me know what you think. All praises to the most high. Allah. Oh, wow.